Among the options on the beer wall at Walter's Sports Bar are Annapolis IPA, Green City IPA, Raised by Wolves, and Vienna Lager. Walter's is located across the street from Nationals Park. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Now he's 3-2 and two on Jones. Here he comes set. The runners go the pitch. Swinging a shot up the middle. Abrams has it go off his glove, deflect into shallow center field. Doyle will score. And over to third goes Rogers. The 1 1. Swinging a slow tapper toward third. Charging in Tana. He gloves. He throws on the move to first. Low, and it can't be scooped by Chaparro. And the Rockies will score another. Tana will pick up his third error in just a handful of games. Bounce the throw. Chaparro couldn't pick it. And so Rogers scores. Jones moves up to second. And welcome to Nat Chat for Wednesday, August 21st, 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who was at Nationals Park. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. Did you see what the Nats AAA affiliate, the Rochester Red Wings, did on X on Monday afternoon? This was clever and also cruel at the same time. You have deserved what I'm about to tell you. We put a plan in place for you uh, to go and work on some skills. The Red Wings put up a video above which was written in all caps, it's time, (laughs) clearly teasing that the video might announce that Dylan Cruz is being promoted to the majors. But next to the it's time was the grinning face with smiling eyes emoji. And sure enough, the video was about a dog, uh, Bruce the Bat Dog. Uh, You worked your tail off every single day. Uh, No, it is not time, at least not yet. Uh, The Nats still have not called up outfielder Dylan Cruz, who per MLB Pipeline is the number three overall prospect in baseball. He remains at AAA Rochester. He on Tuesday night homered. Cruz is the Rochester Red Wings starting center fielder and number one batter in a 9-4 win at the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs on Tuesday night. Went one for five with a three-run homer and a bases-loaded walk. Meantime, the Nats at the major league level They on Tuesday evening scored one run in a loss to one of the worst teams in the majors, a 3-1 loss to the Colorado Rockies at Nationals Park in game one of a three-game series. So the Nats for this regular season now, 56 and 70. The Rockies, 47 and 79, second worst record in the National League. Uh, Coming up later in the show, a report on AAA Rochester from the voice of the Red Wings, Josh Wetzel. Uh, But Mark, uh, there were some good things for the Nats on Tuesday evening. Another strong outing from starting pitcher DJ Hers, a home run from shortstop C.J. Abrams, more production from second baseman Luis Garcia Jr. and right fielder Alex Call. But ultimately, just one run and ultimately another Nats loss. Well, maybe Bruce the Bat Dog should have been called up, Al, because you put him up at the plate in one of those situations in this game. I give him at least a 50-50 chance of coming through with some kind of productive at bat, which is probably better than we got from most of these guys in this game, unfortunately. Yes, there were individually some good things. I thought it was actually a really important start for DJ Hers because his first inning looked like it could go off the rails completely, and he got it together, got out of it with one run, and it was really good the rest of the way and deserved a better fate than he got. I liked the at-bats he got from C.J. Abrams, Luis Garcia, particularly against lefties. We've been talking about wanting to see Garcia against lefties, and he put together some good at-bats. But boy, there just wasn't much else going on for them at the plate. And as frustrating as that is, and as much as you want to get upset by this game, I just, I end up looking at the lineup that they put out there. And 
I don't care who you're facing. You've got Andres Chaparro one week into the big leagues batting third. You have a 7-8-9 that had a combined four home runs in the majors this year. What exactly did you expect from that lineup? It's nobody's fault. This is who they are right now. But every time we hear about Dylan Cruz homering at AAA or Brady House doing something at AAA, it just makes you want even more to see these guys at the big league level. I hope it's coming relatively soon, especially in Dylan Cruz's case, because what they're fielding right now out there, with all due respect to these guys, is not a very imposing lineup on paper. And very often in practice, it has not been imposing either. We thought that the promotion of Dylan Cruz might be coming for this series against the lowly Rockies. That clearly did not happen. And usually the way that these things work is that you promote the highly regarded prospect going into a series. So now that the series has started, it would seem very unlikely that he's being promoted this week. Now, I suppose, you know, somebody gets hurt and maybe plans change. But after this series comes a three-game series at the Atlanta Braves, you're probably not debuting Dylan Cruz on the road like that. Then you do have a substantial homestand, three games against the New York Yankees, three games against the Chicago Cubs so starting next Monday, so August 26th through September 1st. Perhaps during that homestand, we see Dylan Cruz. But boy, this seemed like the right kind of opponent against uh, which to debut a Dylan Cruz, right? The lowly Rockies, although <laughs> the Nats did lose to that team on Tuesday evening. So the Nats in this game, just one run, uh, totaled five hits. Now, three of the hits were extra base hits. The Nats had a home run, two doubles and two singles. Also, the Nats did draw three walks, but the Nats went 0 for 7 with runners in scoring position. Your lone Nationals run in this game coming via a home run by C.J. Abrams. Good to see him homer. He is the Nats starting shortstop and number two batter, one for four with a solo homer. He did strike out three times. Boy, is Abrams striking out a lot lately. Davey Martinez during his postgame press conference, uh, again talking about the Nats chasing pitches, uh, but Abrams did homer. He had a Nats one run six, a leadoff homer to right field to cut the Nats deficit to 3-1. Now, speaking of homers and also of striking out, Joey Gallo finally is back. Uh, The Nats on Tuesday afternoon announced that they had reinstated Gallo from the 10-day injured list, which he had been on since June 12th due to a left hamstring strain. He ended up missing more than two months due to that hamstring injury. And remember, he earlier this season missed some time due to a left shoulder injury. He was on a 10-day IL uh, April 27th to May 17th due to a left shoulder injury. So Gallo was back. He did not start in this game, did pinch hit. He, in the bottom of the ninth, drew a pinch one-out walk despite having been down in the count at 1.12. The corresponding roster move to the Nats activating Gallo was them optioning outfielder slash DH Travis Blankenhorn to AAA Rochester. But here's what I want to get to, and and it uh, tag teams with what you were just talking about. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how much Joey Gallo plays. We know that the Nats are in the midst of this youth movement, but to your point about the underwhelming nature of the lineup, I mean, you look at the two most recent first basemen slash DHs for the Nats here, Andres Chaparro and Juan Yepes. These guys have cooled off big time. Chaparro on Tuesday evening as an Nats starting first baseman and number three batter 0 for 4. And Yepes, who we have not talked about much lately, he is an Nats starting DH and number five batter on Tuesday evening 0 for 3. Yepes's numbers have really come down. Chaparro, since the uh, three-double Major League regular season debut, has not done much. And uh, I wonder if we're going to be seeing a good bit of Gallo. So at least going into this game, the sense I was getting is that There's not an intention to play a lot of Gallo, not to bury him on the bench, but it's not like, oh, he's the experienced guy. He's going to step right in, become the regular starting first baseman or even right fielder or DH. They do want to look at the younger guys. Now, as you point out, some of these guys have not been producing a whole lot lately. They've certainly seen a good amount of Juan Yepes at this point. Is there a lot more to be gained there? Maybe. Maybe you want to see if he can bounce back from an extended slump and see if he can't do something for you before season's end. You know, Andres Chaparro, I I just thinking to myself, all the top prospects they've called up over the years who've had to earn their way up the lineup over like weeks or even months. And Andres Chaparro, you know, within a couple of days was hitting cleanup and a week in is hitting third based on what exactly? I guess that three double game in his debut, this was not a highly touted prospect. This is not somebody who since that opening game has really shown much of anything, I guess you just look at what else they have and, okay, who, if not him, then who? So I think at the moment, Gallo's not really in the everyday plans. But 
you only need to see so much of these other guys. And if there comes a point where it's clear that they are not the answer in the long term, I don't know that you have to ride this out for the rest of the season with Andres Taparo and Jose Tena and Juan Yepes and everybody else. Maybe you'd go ahead and give Gallo some at bats. At least he gives you the threat of the home run. But beyond that, maybe there is still somebody else to be called up from AAA. And I think that's really where the focus is going to be right now. Yeah, it's funny. I think of Chaparro, Tena, and Yepes as all being in the same bucket. Like they're all similar guys, mid 20 ish type prospects, none of whom is like a highly regarded prospect, each of whom at times has actually looked kind of sort of good. But yeah, it's like, how much do you want to see each guy? Now, look, Joey Gallo is not in the plans, presumably beyond this season. So I'm certainly not going to sit here and champion Joey Gallo playing a bunch uh, as this season goes on. But you do wonder if the Nats, uh, David Martinez in particular, going to be tempted here to play Gallo. And, you know, I thought about this. So uh, Chaparro, right, first baseman. Gallo, we know, good defensive first baseman. I feel like Gallo would have made a play that Chaparro did not in this game. So Tenna got charged with a two-out throwing error in a Rockies two-run six. Top of the six, runners at the corners, two outs. Tenna fielded a grounder off the bat of Jordan Beck, then got charged with a throwing error on what was, yes, a low throw. But boy, I thought that was a throw that Chaparro could have caught, did not catch. Uh, a run scored. Rockies went up 3 nothing. We know, if nothing else, Gallo has provided good defense at first base this season. And uh, the Nats defense lately, as we have discussed, has not been good. And there could be value there the rest of the year in trying to help the younger infielders feel good about themselves. Abrams, Garcia, Tena, or whoever ends up at third base. So while offensively, you may be saying, yeah, we don't really need to see Joey Gallo out there a whole lot. Defensively, it might actually make a difference and actually help the younger guys in a way to have his presence out there. So I I think that's worth considering here along the way. I don't feel like Chaparro or Yepes, to be honest, has shown a whole lot in the defensive realm. You know, bigger picture here, here's what I'm left with thinking. What are the odds that any of these guys who are here right now are going to be their first baseman next year? Probably pretty low. What are the odds that anybody who's here right now is going to be their third baseman on opening day next year? Probably not unless somebody really steps up here. And what are the odds that Alex Call is going to be their starting right fielder on opening day? Very slim on that. So we've reached that point that I think is pretty frustrating for everybody in that there's still a good chunk of the season left. You want to believe that they're heading in the right direction. You know there are bigger names still to come. You'd love to see them as much as you can before this season is over because you know they are part of the plan for next year, but you can't rush these things. You can't force it. If the organization doesn't believe they're ready yet, you don't make that move yet. But what you're left with in the interim is what we saw here on on Tuesday night. We call this playing out the string. And uh, there certainly is a feeling that that is what is happening here. You mentioned Alex Call. He did have another at least uh, decent game offensively. Had a double and a walk on Tuesday evening. Uh, Call as an ad starting right fielder and number one batter. One for three. Bottom of the third. Drew a two out nine pitch walk. Bottom of the eighth, had a one-out double to the left center field gap. So your Alex Call OPS over 103 major league plate appearances is regular season now at 993. And Luis Garcia Jr., he in this game as an ad starting second baseman and number six batter, two for three with a double, a single, and a walk. Garcia in the bottom of the second, a two-out double off the right field wall. Garcia in the bottom of the fifth to a leadoff walk, and Garcia in the bottom of the ninth, a one-out single to center field on an 0-2 pitch. He does continue to be number one among all qualified Nats players in OPS for this regular season at 789. So good to see those things, but uh, just not much happening offensively for the Nats in this game beyond those things. Hey, Al Galdi here to tell you about the latest great offer from Window Nation for listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. Get two free windows for every two windows that you buy, plus pay nothing with no interest for two full years, plus get an additional $250 credit. If you have been thinking about getting new windows, now is the time. Take advantage of this offer from Window Nation. Call 866-90NATION or visit windownation.com and tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat Podcast. Window Nation windows are outstanding. 96% customer satisfaction rating. 96% of Window Nation windows installed require no follow-up service, and Window Nation has received more than 33,000 
five-star reviews on Google. Take advantage of this offer. Two free windows for every two windows that you buy. Plus, pay nothing with no interest for two full years and get an additional $250 credit. 866-90NATION or windownation.com. Tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat Podcast. 866-90NATION or windownation.com. And tell Window Nation that Al Galdi sent you. He was really good after that. I mean, he just attacked his own, uh, worked ahead, got, got you know early swing outs. Um, but he was he was really good. But you know he was around the plate. I mean, you you know he threw the ball the first inning ball. Just everything was you know the balls they hit were middle middle. And he settled down and started, started pitching really well and, and utilizing all his pitches. So he kept us in the game. You know, I mean, it's the furthest he's gone in a while, but he threw the ball well. Well, a big-time bright spot for the Nats in this 3-1 loss to the Rockies on Tuesday evening was starting pitcher DJ Herz, who now, I think, undeniably is the Nats' most consistent starting pitcher. Like, right now, at this point in time, if you're awarding that title to a Nats starting pitcher, you're giving it to DJ Herz. He allowed three runs, two earned in five and two-thirds innings with seven strikeouts, so another high strikeout game for Herz. He gave up six hits, which were a double and five singles. He issued two walks. He threw a lot of strikes, 93 pitches, 61 strikes, 32 balls. Now, his uh, top of the first was not so good, although he somehow only allowed one run in that top of the first. He gave up three consecutive one-out hits, which were a double and two singles. He also issued a two-out walk, and we in this inning had a one-out passed ball by Riley Adams, who was an ad starting catcher in this game, but hers then settled down. He at one point in the outing retired 12 consecutive batters, and so, like you said earlier, what could have been a disastrous outing ended up being a rather good outing for hers. That first inning was huge for him. I mean, if you just watched it, it was such an ugly inning in a variety of ways. It wasn't just DJ hers. It was other stuff going on. And it very much looked like it was about to completely collapse on him. And we're going to be talking about yet another 30 plus pitch first inning that got out of control for a Nat starter and set the tone for the whole evening. And so for him to get through that, and there was a big strikeout of Rogers and then the grounder back to him with the shuffle pass to first. We haven't seen J.J. Hers have to do a lot in the field so far, certainly not as much as Mitchell Parker has done. I will just tell you, watching him in spring training, there was some real concern about him as a defensive pitcher. I believe he's only had three balls hit to him now already this year, which is amazing. It's all that he's had to deal with, and he's gotten all three outs. He's not making routine throws to first. He is clearly getting as close to first as he can and either lobbing it in there or the shovel pass or whatever, but not pretty, but it's effective. It's getting the job done. So good for him for overcoming whatever issue he may have in that regard. He gets through the inning and it's like he flipped the switch after that was fantastic. 12 in a row that he retired after that inning. And you're seeing some maturity and some growth here. I mean, this is a guy who we know has the ability any given night to look great And then you thought, well, on the nights he doesn't have it, how's that going to go? We're starting to see some consistency, as you said. And that's a big thing that I'm not sure we really anticipated happening. I thought there'd be some more bumps along the road here for him. But by and large, since that brief uh, demotion around the All-Star break for him, he's been pretty good and giving them some length and keeping the damage to a minimum. He deserved really better than the final outcome where three runs, two of them earned. Uh, He almost got out of the sixth inning with it still being a one nothing game and and was like just on the verge of that happening. So I thought this was a big step for him. And it's been a really nice sustained stretch for him. In a time in which we have seen Mackenzie Gore unravel, we have seen Jake Irvin be up and down. We have seen Mitchell Parker be very up and down. And we have seen Patrick Corbin be Patrick Corbin. DJ Hurst has actually been rather consistent for the Nats over these last few weeks. You mentioned that break. So July 8th to July 23rd was the uh, break for DJ Hurst. He was sent back down to AAA Rochester during that time. He's since being recalled from Rochester on July 23rd, has the following stats, six starts, an ERA of 3.07, a strikeouts per nine innings of 10.43. He has gone from a guy who is having these wide ranging outcomes, either like really good or really bad, to now this like steadying presence in the rotation here lately. So good job, DJ Hers. 
The Nats' bullpen in this game actually was good. Uh, four Nats relievers combined for three and a third shutout innings. Eduardo Salazar officially tossed a third of a scoreless inning. He and the Rockies, a two-run six, faced two batters, got one out. Tanner Rainey tossed two-thirds of a scoreless inning. He in the top of the seventh faced three batters and got two outs. Jose A. Ferrer did well. He tossed one and a third scoreless innings. He in the top of the seventh faced two batters and got one out. He then tossed a perfect top of the eighth. And Robert Garcia tossed a scoreless top of the ninth despite giving up three singles. Uh, Garcia is back. The Nats on Tuesday afternoon announced that they had reinstated Garcia from the bereavement list uh, and had optioned reliever Orlando Rebolta to AAA Rochester. I did want to bring up Rainey. So, you know, he has kind of graduated here from like never being used or only being used in blowout circumstances to now he is being pitched uh, pretty regularly at this point. So at least there's that. And I suppose that's by necessity. I mean, at some point, the Nats were going to have to start pitching him some more. And sure enough, we are seeing him pitch more. Well, yeah, I mean, right now, after Kyle Figgin, who's your top setup man? I think it's Jacob Barnes at the moment. And again, this is by default with Hunter Harvey traded, Dylan Floro traded, Derek Law now on the IL, though there was some good news there. The MRI on his elbow came back clean. It's just some nerve irritation. So the hope is it's not going to be a lengthy stay for him. But yeah, you, you have to just put Rainey out there and see what he does. And it's been better, not consistently every single time, but it has been better. I've been glad to see him get more regular work at least. And as much as we talk about needing to see a lot of the young hitters here down the stretch, that applies to some of the pitchers too. And I think Rainey's on that list. You've, you've got to kind of figure out here, is he still a part of this? Can he regain something of the form that he had prior to the Tommy John surgery and be considered someone you can use in situations of consequence. I mean, they've stuck it out with him all year. We've talked about this with him and for a long time, Jordan Weems, before they finally cut bait there a week ago. They've stuck it out. It's time now to find out was it worth it or not and and see if he can be still a part of this moving forward. And in some small doses so far, it's it's been okay. So that's something. <laughs> Tim Shover is here to tell you about Game Time. Shows this September at the Anthem in D.C. include Kings of Leon, Ringo Starr, and Weezer. If you're interested in finding tickets to any of these shows, make sure to check out the Game Time app. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you the complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Here comes the 1-1. Swing a high drive, well hit right center field. Way back it goes, and it is gone. Two rows in over the out-of-town scoreboard. C.J. Abrams connects. Rockies three, Nationals one. Nats get on the board on Abrams' 18th home run. All over an elevated fastball and sends it out to right center. So next up for the Nats is game two of this series against the Rockies. So Wednesday evening at 645, Mitchell Parker will be the Nats starting pitcher. And as we just mentioned, 
really up and down last few weeks for Parker. He's coming off that wretched outing from uh, this past Thursday evening, that 13-3 loss at the Philadelphia Phillies. Parker in that game, nine runs in three innings. Now, his start prior to that went pretty well. Two runs, uh, both of which were unearned in six into third innings. Uh, that in the 3-2-10 uh, inning win over the Los Angeles Angels at Nationals Park on August 9th. So it has become kind of a grab bag with Mitchell Parker here lately. He might do really well. He might get shellacked. Obviously, you want to see him get back to being what he had been, which was a very consistent pitcher for the Nats. But the last few weeks have been odd for this guy. It has. I mean, also consider the matchups, you know, good against the Angels, not good against the Phillies. Okay, well, we kind of can tell a little slight difference between those two lineups. Now he's going to face a Rockies team that, while they do hit for some power, uh, but away from Coors Field, maybe not as much. So I would hope it's a favorable matchup for him and a chance to kind of reestablish himself again. Yeah, I'm interested to see uh, these guys. He and hers are kind of in that same category all along of you heard about them coming into the season. You knew we we're going to see them at some point. They kind of burst out of the gates so impressively that they set the bar a little bit high, maybe higher than we thought they would be. And so in the end, if they're coming back to earth, is that just kind of coming back to where they were going to be all along? Or can they be the guy we saw in May and June and actually be quite effective? on a regular basis at the big league level. I think we need to find that out, and that's what the rest of the season is for. You hope it's the case, but I think you also have to remind yourself these were not the elite prospects on the pitching side of things. There was reason to be excited about them. They've certainly shown us some things this year of what they can be. Hers has taken an important step, as we just, uh, just discussed, over the last several weeks. I think it's time for Parker to show, can he be that guy as well? And firmly established that he is part of this rotation going into next season. I think his fate is still very much up in the air. There are six weeks left and a bunch of starts for him still to make that I think will determine just exactly how he does fit into their 2025 rotation plan. Yeah, it's not fair, but it is reality that this onus has been placed upon hers and Parker and Irvin because of what has happened this season with Gray and Gore and Cavalli and Rutledge. Like those four guys were supposed to be foundational pieces in this rebuild. And for a variety of reasons, those guys have not had good 2024 seasons. And so, you know, and we've talked about this, if not for hers and Parker and Irvin, man, what would we be saying (laughs) about the state of national starting pitching, at least with those guys, you feel reasonably good about things. But, you know, if you would have told me going into this season, all that was going to go down with Gray and Gore and Cavalli and Rutledge, I mean, think about how just downtrodden we would have all been hearing that stuff. So yeah, it's not fair, but it just, it is what the situation is. Hers and Irvin and Parker, we now focus on and talk about in a certain way because it's almost like you have to. If you don't, it's a little scary to think about what you're looking at in terms of Nat starting pitching. We would have thought the season was going to be a disaster and the rotation was going to be a disaster given all those things you just outlined. So yeah, it has been the saving grace for them. I think Irvin, there was always some hope based on what we saw last year. Last year was surprising, but he did show enough to say, yeah, he should be part of it. And I think that's instructive as we look at Parker and hers now. They're kind of right now where Jake Irvin was a year ago, where he came up as a bit of a surprise a little bit early, had some success, struggled some, but at the end of the year, he said, okay, there's something there. And that he really took off this year to an extent that a lot of people maybe weren't counting on. So can either or both of the young lefties now duplicate next year what Irvin has done this year? That would bode really well for them in the future. But I think we have to remind ourselves that that's not necessarily the expectation. That's the hope. But it's not like these guys were so highly touted or or had such a pedigree as if to say, yeah, they're supposed to be that guy. Hopefully, at least one of them does. And you hope that in both cases, they finish out the year strong and at least position themselves well going into next year. Before we throw to the update on the Rochester Red Wings from the voice of the Red Wings, Josh Wetzel, Josh was kind enough to send us an email regarding a discussion we had on the last installment of the podcast uh, regarding Dylan Cruz. So one of the interesting things about Cruz's season are these extreme home road splits to where AA Harrisburg, AAA Rochester, his numbers in road games are a lot better than his numbers in home games. And Josh noted this in his email. He said, heard your discussion about the crew's home road splits. Rochester has generally played pretty neutral, although our hitters don't think so. (laughs) It has played as a decent pitcher's park this year. 
Harrisburg is renowned as being pitcher-friendly. Additionally, a bunch of Dylan's road series with us have been at Syracuse and Worcester, which are both great places to hit. So something to keep in mind, some context for, yeah, what are some really striking home road splits? His home numbers this season at both Harrisburg and Rochester are pretty underwhelming, and his road numbers are outstanding. And so I know when people look at his overall numbers, they sometimes say, well, those are okay or even pretty good, but not great. But there's important uh, context to what has happened there, and we appreciate Josh shedding some light on that. I'm really fascinated whenever it happens, if it's within the next week or if the next month or whenever it is. I'm really fascinated to see what Dylan Cruz is as a big league hitter. As you said, the minor league performances have at times looked great, at times looked kind of blah, nothing all that spectacular. But we know the pedigree. We know it wasn't just the Nationals. The entire baseball world saw this guy as a can't miss prospect, really advanced hitter, did it at the absolute highest level at LSU under the spotlight. You feel like this is a guy who just needed his time in the minors and that the results weren't even necessarily that important, just the experience, and that once he gets here on the big stage, he's going to be just fine, if not great. We'll see. I really am curious to see how that goes because if he does get called up you know, very soon here, it's sort of performance-based, but it's not really. It, it's much more about what his reputation is, I think, than the actual performance. If if he was a third-round pick instead of the number two overall pick, and he had the exact same minor league career that he's had to date, we probably wouldn't be talking about him in the same way. It's not in terms of like, oh, man, this guy's right on the cusp. We'd say, well, we want to see a little bit more from him before you, you throw him to the wolves like that. But because he is who he is, because the reputation was so good, I think there's a feeling like, it's bound to happen here soon, and maybe he's going to be a guy who the minor league numbers don't really matter that much. It was just a matter of getting the experience, and that under the bright lights of the big leagues, that's where he's really going to shine. Number two overall pick out of LSU, 2023 MLB draft, and no doubt, I mean, he was comped to Mike Trout when the Nats took him. Like, that's the kind of territory he was thrust into, so we shall see, but we do remain on Dylan Cruz Watch. Uh, you tell us what you think. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show natschatpodcast at gmail.com. We invite you to check out our website natschatpodcast.com in which you can purchase a Nats Chat podcast t-shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat podcast. And we leave you now with this report on the Rochester Red Wings from the voice of the Red Wings, Josh Wetzel. The pitch. And Cruz with the drive out towards deep right center field. This is going to be trouble. Croon on the run. McKenna back to the track, and it's gone. Opposite field, three-run homer for Dylan Cruz. He's driven in four. We're only in the fourth inning. And the Red Wings lead it 5-1 here in the top of the four. Hey there, Josh Wetzel from Rochester checking in with a Red Wings update as of Sunday. The Wings just had a six-game win streak snapped on Sunday, but they are still in second place in the second half of the International League season, nine games over 500 in the second half of the year. As far as how some of the Wings hitters are doing right now, Dylan Cruz is hitting pretty well his last 20 games, batting about 270, 11 of his 22 hits in that time or extra base hits. His OPS over his last 20 games, about 850, and he's been playing a very good outfield in his first 45 games with the Red Wings. He's hitting 257 with a 784 OPS. Brady House at third base, his first 27 games in AAA, hitting 273 with five home runs, 24 batted in. He's coming out for a really big series in which in six games against Syracuse, he went eight for 24 with three doubles and three home runs. And House is also playing very good defense at third base. Trey Lipscomb in his five games back with the Red Wings after getting option from the Nationals has gone five for 17 with a double. And maybe the Wings' hottest hitter right now is Darren Baker, second baseman slash outfielder. He has a 10-game hitting streak going, hitting almost 360 during that time. Overall in the year, Baker's hitting 284, and he's in the top 10 in the league in base hits, second in the league with 37 stolen bases while only getting thrown out two times. Just to highlight a couple of Red Wings pitchers, Andrew Alvarez, the reigning Nationals minor league pitcher of the year, just went seven strong innings on Friday night, allowing only one run. His best start so far as a Red Wing. Over his last three starts, he's only allowed three earned runs and 18 innings of work. And he's worked at least five innings and allowed two runs or fewer 
in six of his 10 starts so far. Probably the most impressive Red Wing pitcher has been Brad Lord. In his first nine starts in AAA, Lord has gone two and two with a 3.14 earned run average. Unfortunately, in his last start, he got hit by a comebacker on his pitching hand off the bat of Jackie Bradley Jr. Had to come out of the game in the second inning. No word yet on how bad of an injury that is. I think the Wings are hoping it's day to day with Brad Lord. That's an update for the Rochester Red Wings as of Sunday. Rannick pauses and pitches. Swing and a high drive in a deep left field. Rosario moves back. He's on the track. He's in the fence. It's gone. House homers. Two nothing Red Wings. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed.